do a presentation today on escaping capability traps through problem-driven iterative adaptation. It's called PDIA. Uh, someone, uh, when, when I did a presentation of this at ODR uh, in April, someone created a blog afterwards to say, can we get a new name for PDIA? So uh, you can go and see that if you want to. Um, the, uh, I have co-authors, Land Pritchard and Michael Wilcock, who are not here, but uh, they are very much involved in the work. Um, let me structure the talk by saying, you know, I'm going to explain where we came to this idea of capability traps, what we're talking about, uh, why we think capability traps exist, and why they exist even though we've been making observations that could have got us out of these traps for at least 20 or 30 years. Uh, and I think that the sad thing is it's not just your work that's made these observations. I think that there are many people, you know, the learning process theory of people like uh, David Hume 30 years ago was saying some of this kind of stuff. I think uh, this isn't new, but why are we stuck? And we'll speak about this thing that uh, we call the big stuck in development, which I think is a big stuff for countries and it's a big stuck for us as, uh, as the international community uh, donors, etc. Uh, when I speak about us, I'll speak about us. I used to be at the bank and I still see myself very much a part of the community, uh, which I think uh, Niels probably uh, understands, having just left but still being there, right? It's very strange. Um, and then I will speak about PDIA as a way to escape capability traps. And then I'm going to speak about practical examples from recent work. And the one thing that I want to say here is that um, one of the things that Land, myself, and Michael have tried to do is to take the work outside of theory, and we don't want to speak about how development should be done. We want, we've been making empirical observations about how successes that we see have been done, and those empirical observations are what inform how we think development should move ahead. So this isn't about kind of saying, well, here's something that you should try, but it hasn't been done. Be the guinea pig. We're kind of saying... We do this already, we just don't do enough of it. So it's possible, but we need to do more of it. So let me get into this. And I will, I will uh, apologize for being an academic and using really bad PowerPoint slides. Um, but uh, far too much writing on the PowerPoint slides. I never got to work in McKinsey and learn how to do it properly. So let's say, firstly, what is capability? And I'll say capability is just kind of having what it takes to function effectively. Okay, and that's my definition of that right now. And so let's say that for the last 30 years, the donor community has been ramping up capability-enhancing work, which is capacity building or institutional reforms or whatever you want to call it, and ramping them up pretty aggressively. And in the last decade, probably more so than any other time. You see the amount of money, you see the projects, you see the variety of activity has really, really grown in this period of time. But what we see coming from these things is a lot of improved form without function. Now, I agree that, you know, the whole story isn't a bad story, and there are many, many places where things look a lot better, and there are many reasons why that has nothing to do with the reforms that were done in many places. It has to do with uh, economic growth. It has to do with uh, the, the fact that the world itself has become a, let's say, more successful place to be in in the last 50 years. Um, but many of the reforms that we've put in place, when you start to look at them, it, it, they haven't necessarily improved functionality of states. They've made states look a lot better, but they haven't necessarily made them better. Let me give you some examples from the data that I in, uh, examined in the book um, and uh, in some other places as well. The FIFA scores from countries show that many, many countries are kind of doing fairly well. A lot of countries get A's, they get B's, uh, uh, and, and sometimes they even look like they're improving over time. Liberia is an example recently. Marcus uh, has a team working there where their PIFA score improved over time. Uganda, their PIFA score improved over time. The interesting thing, though, is if you tear the PIFA scores apart, you can identify the parts of the PIFA scores where you can get an A or a B fairly easily by passing a law, introducing a new, new process. If it's not implemented or not used, you can still get an A or B. And then there's other questions where you actually have to use the things to get an A or B. And if you take those two sets of questions, one which we would call the de facto and the other the de jure, we find that the scores are very different and they're very big gaps that the countries that are doing well are the countries that are excelling on passing the laws, introducing the processes, but the implementation of those things is lagging. The other thing that's interesting is that the implementation gap grows over time. 
So when I give you an example of Liberia and Uganda and they look better over time, what's happening is that the laws and the processes and the systems are looking better and better, but the implementation is actually going down of those things. Okay? So this is what I mean by form versus function. The, another place, uh, another area where you can see this is anti-corruption laws, and I'm going to be harping on Uganda a bit, and Rene was just there, so you'll be able to see uh, what's in the paper that you're going to read. But in anti-corruption work, actually we see a lot of things improving in a lot of countries. Most countries have got uh, um, anti-corruption commissions, laws, whistleblower laws, ethics, uh, codes of ethics, all of these things now. If you don't have those, you're just kind of not part of the crowd anymore. Uganda actually has the best legal framework to fight corruption in the world, according to Global Integrity, a think tank out of Washington. They score like 99 out of 100. Uh, Germany scores 82. It's really interesting, right? I think that, um, uh, I think Italy scores something like 81 or maybe 79 or something. It, Uganda's implementation is very weak. It's a 49, which means that they have a gap uh, of about 50, 51, all right? The German gap is something like six, uh, and the Italian gap is, I think, eight. So, you know, I often say to people, Italy is what Italy is. You, you, you look at the laws and you look at the implementation, they don't look that great, but they are what they are. Uganda looks fabulous, but it's not real, right? And this holds for the whole of the developing world on these indicators, the whole of the developing world. And part of it is that when we do the reforms, the reforms make us look better and better and better. Actually, the story in Uganda is a really sad one because every few years in the last 15, they've had a major, major corruption crisis. Uh, they went through one last year, which you guys would know about more than I do. I, I'm not sure what the response is going to be to the most recent one, but previously the response was almost routinely to introduce new laws. And the donors went along with it every single time. So it expanded this gap instead of closing the gap. And then we wonder why they have a crisis. So the last one I will share with you is tax collection in Mauritania, which I love. Uh, some colleagues of mine did a study of tax collection in Mauritania because they wanted to understand you know, uh, how well the system worked. And they, they found that uh, in a sample of uh, taxpayers, 80% of those people evaded taxes. You say, well, maybe it was just because they don't have a tax bureau in Maur Mauritania. No, they have a tax bureau. Say, so, well, maybe it was because, you know, they, 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 they didn't get visited by the tax officials. No, no, no. 75% of the 80% who were evaders were visited by the tax officials. You say, well, maybe they weren't actually formally audited. 30% of them were formally audited, and they still evaded the taxes. So this is saying that you still have the tax bureau. They do the visits. They do the audits. They do everything that on paper we say they should do, and still the system doesn't work. Now, I could go into thousands of stories. We could talk about doing business indicators and the fact that countries have improved on their doing business indicators, and everyone gets very excited about this. But then there's the business enterprise surveys. Doing business indicators say, what does the law say should be the amount of time it, create, you, you, it takes to, to open a warehouse? And the business enterprise services uh, surveys tell us how long it actually takes. And what do we see? Gigantic gaps. We see countries improving on the doing business indicators and actually getting worse on the, on the enterprise service. So this is what we see the capability traps about. It's essentially, we're looking like we can function, but we don't really function very well. And the gap between these two things is growing. And it's almost like saying that, you know, we have this peg that we're doing, which is what the reforms are, and we have a hole, which is the context of it. And the peg doesn't seem to fit into the context. Now and again it does, and it's, and it's a fantastic fit, and it's great. But we end up with a lot of pegs and a lot of holes, and nothing that really fits. And um, this is what I think development looks like in many countries. So then the question is, why? Why is this the case? And, and, and even more so, why does it persist? Why do you have this long list of all the things that your organization has been thinking about for 30 years, and for 30 years you've said the same message, which I think is the right message, again and again and again, and, and, and yet it doesn't really impact anything. So this was the question that Land, Michael, and myself started asking. Land is an economist, Michael is a sociologist, and I'm a public administration person, which means I'm, I'm nothing really, I guess. Um, but essentially, part of the story is three people from very, very different disciplines came together and said, let's put our heads together to try and understand why this continues, even though we know it's a problem. 
And the first thing we identified was that the three of us uh, had answers about very different things. Uh, Lant would speak about the answers about kind of the economic incentives of individuals. I would speak about the incentives and the behavior of organizations. And Michael would speak about societies. And we started to say, gee, it's very interesting because all my solutions would be to make the organizations function better. All Lant's solutions would be to create better incentives for the individuals. And all of Michael's solutions would be at the society level. What happens if the problem is at all of those? What happens if the problem is at all of those? And this is where we came up with what we call the big stack analysis, where we say you have agents, organizations, and ecosystems. And that you have different kind of uh, objectives and tensions at all three levels. It's a very, very simple analysis that says that the ecosystem for your organization at the top could be an ecosystem, and this would be the kind of environment in which you're in, other organizations around you, the things that create incentives for your organization to behave. Okay? How are you evaluated by your funders? How, are, how do citizens perceive you? Uh, what are the pressures from the international community on a government? Okay? We say there's kind of two extreme approaches that you could have in your ecosystem. The one thing is that your ecosystem could be a closed ecosystem when it comes to novelty. Because our ecosystem doesn't want you to do new things. We just want you to comply with the agenda which we set. Okay? And if you don't comply with the agenda which we set, we're going to penalize you as an organization or as a country. On the other extreme, we could say, we as an ecosystem value novelty. We want you to be creative, and we are actually going to uh, reward you when you become more functional and, more, and, 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 and you can do better things. We don't really care how, what that looks like. Okay? That's what's going on at the ecosystem. Think in terms of development. What kind of indicators do we set? How do we assess countries? What do we say is you're on the right track in terms of governance versus you're on the wrong track in terms of governance? Okay? Our argument would be very much that you're on the left-hand side, but I'm going to get there in a second. In terms of the organization, we would say if you're in a situation where you have a closed uh, agenda-driven uh, system and where your organization is very dependent on its environment for money, for legitimacy, and for support, and where what you're doing is really, really hard to do, so you don't really know how to do it, so trying to fun become functional is actually a very risky thing, and there's a lot of opaque politics, so you don't necessarily see what's going on. What you're going to opt for is what we call isomorphic mimicry. And isomorphic mimicry is essentially, we're going to try and look like the other people who look more successful. Because that's a strategy that we can use to get ourselves legitimacy in the short run, and if it doesn't work in the long run, we probably won't be here. Okay? So we see this in nature all the time, uh, in, and the concept of isomorphism actually comes from biology. It's the idea that uh, you'll have one snake with red stripes uh, that uh, is, is poisonous, and so the birds leave that snake alone. And over millions of years of evolution, uh, other snakes adopt red stripes. They don't adopt the poison of the poisonous snake. They adopt the red stripes. It's a very effective strategy for them to survive in the environment because the birds don't know which ones have the poison or not. Does that make sense? So it's the same thing with organizations is, well, I don't really know how to become functional, but I need, the legitim I need to appear legitimate. So I'm going to look functional even though I'm not functional. Does it make sense? On the other hand, you could have organizations who kind of say, I don't really care what I look like. I need to demonstrate success. I actually need to deliver the mail. Some of my colleagues did this great uh, study on, on gaps where they, they uh, sent mail out to a bunch of countries or every country in the world. Uh, and they waited to see which uh, mail that, that to fictitious people and fictitious addresses under the assumption that a functional a post office system would send it back to you. And they found that most post offices in most parts of the world, not even poor countries only, just didn't manage to do that. But in some cases, demonstrated success in this is important. We need to be able to do it. So you get that at the organization level. At the agents level, you also get different kind of objectives. On the one extreme, you get leadership strategies uh, and strategies of front farm workers that are really about the perpetuation of the organization and self-interest. Now, this could look like corruption, or this could just look like, what do I need to do to do well in my career? 
You know, what, what backs do I need to scratch? Uh, what boxes do I need to tick? And my focus is really on making sure the organization survives and making sure that I maximize my self-interest in that organization. On the other extreme, you could have the incentives for individuals to be value creators uh, and, and, and to actually kind of get things done, okay? So this is what we looked at between the three of us, and we said, well, the problem with a lot of development is that you're stuck in the left-hand side. And you're not stuck because of what's going on with agents or organizations or the ecosystem. You're stuck because all three of those things are conspired against you, and they hold you back. So what do we have? We have fixed and clear agendas. And I think the, the comment that uh, uh, Niels was making about, you know, I liked your figure showing that in the last five or six years, maybe it's been dipping down. To me, I think this actually started, in the, started when the world governance indicators came out. Because I think that what the world governance indicators did, and shortly after them, the doing business indicators, and shortly after them, PIFA, and then all of the other indicator sets that we use to assess countries, is they fixed the agendas. So PIFA is probably the best example. PIFA gives you 64 dimensions of a good PFM system. This is what it looks like. The agenda is fixed. This is what you need to do to have a good PFM system. Now, the people who wrote PIFA say, well, we didn't intend it like that. I say, well, that's, what, that, that's actually what the document says, literally what the document says. Don't play games here. You fix the agenda. So you fix the agenda. You reward compliance with the agenda. You want a loan, you do what's in the agenda. You'll get a loan, right? Okay? What about if a country says, look, we don't really care about how you tell us we want to do it. We're going to do a procurement system that is the procurement system we want. We're not going to do this thing of competitive procurement. We don't really believe in that. We're going to kind of just make it work in the way that it works in our country. Yeah, you're not going to get the money for that. It's just not going to happen. So in the ecosystem, we have these agendas that are very, very rigid, and we reward compliance with them. For the organization, survival depends on external support via compliance. So your organizations and governments, they're basically looking for the loan, and they're saying, what do we need to do to get the loan? And in many senses, it ends up with this kind of isomorphic mimicry. And then you say, well, what's happening with agents? Well, again, the rewards are for survival, not for performance. And this is demonstrated in country after country, where you see the perpetuation of ministries that don't do things, and you see the perpetuation of people and people moving up the rank who don't necessarily do things. So we say, well, if all of those are stuck, how do we get out of this? Now, a lot of our strategies to get unstuck are about moving on one level. So we might say, well, we're going to build capability in the organization and we're going to introduce performance management so the organization has to demonstrate success. But if the organization has to demonstrate success but the ecosystem is still rewarding compliance, then all you're going to have is a brief interlude out onto the right-hand side, but it's going to pull you back. Or if you say, let's get better people. But if you get better people but the organization rewards compliance with a, a, an external agenda, what are those people going to do? They're going to carry on doing the same thing as the other people. So the problem is that you get stuck on all three levels and it's really, really hard to get yourself unstuck. What we actually see whenever we try to get unstuck is this is where some of the cool stuff happens in development. But my colleague, Land Pritchard, he calls it, and he says this is the problem of effervescent bubbles. Is you're, you see cool stuff, but if you go back in five years' time, you see different cool stuff. Because the people who were trying to get out of the stuck, the big stuck, are no longer there because they got pulled back into it. So it's really a system that is holding us back rather than one individual or an organizational problem um, or just a problem with, um, with uh, incentives. So let me try and go through quickly, how do states escape the capability trap? And again, what I'll say to you is our research here hasn't been sitting back and thinking, okay, let's kind of theorize about this. We've been looking around and saying, well, you know, South Korea didn't get stuck in this. It just didn't. I mean, it's true, right? Singapore didn't get stuck in this. At the moment, in many of the sectors, Rwanda doesn't seem like it's stuck in this, in this trap. It seems that it's becoming more functional pretty rapidly. Uh, there are many, many examples, and so we spent a fair amount of time looking at those examples in areas like judicial reform, which is Michael's area, uh, education and health, which is Lance and mine, which is mostly the governance area. And we came up with this thing called problem-driven iterative adaptation. And the basic idea is this, is that what you want to do is you want to focus building state capability for implementation. 
In all the places that we spoke about, the focus was not on an agenda. It was a, fo it was a focus on actually doing stuff. And it was a focus on doing measurable stuff and often in fairly small bites and in a very, very aggressive way so that the government could actually perform core responsibilities. Gets the conversation about what is in our results agenda. Our results agenda at the moment is about these kind of process compliance agendas. But in many of these countries, they just didn't have time for this. Uh, I love some of the, the books of people uh, like uh, Park Chang-hee um, and, and Lee Kuan Yew when they speak about uh, the early days in in Korea and in Singapore, uh, where, of course, in all of these stories, you have a dark side, which is interesting as well. But Lee Kuan Yew in particular said, we did not have a time for, we didn't, we didn't have time for agendas. We didn't have time for people to say, that's what you need to do. What we had time for is, we need to improve service delivery, we're going to try a bunch of things, and that's what we're going to do. So the focus is, you know, can you actually deliver mail? Can you collect taxes? Can you immunize babies? Can you educate kids and minister justice and regulate firms? It's not, do you have a school system that looks like you can do these things? Can you do them is the key metric. Second thing that we see is that success builds good institutions, not vice versa. And this is an interesting thing for theoreticians because theory has told us that institutions breed success. And what we say is success breeds good institutions. When, because we don't know what institutions are going to breed success in Tanzania. We just don't know because Tanzania is not Germany. Okay? So the idea is that when you get success, then you get the basis of having something that you can institutionalize. But we need to know what success looks like before we institutionalize it. So we have four principles of PDA, and it develops all of the principles that you guys spoke about just now are, are in here. The first one is we think that it should be local solutions for local problems, which means it needs to be problem driven. And I'm going to get into this in a second, a little bit more detail. The second thing is that you want to push for positive deviance or for solutions that uh, go outside of the norm and that you kind of have some sense that you can do. The third thing is that you want to do the iterate and adapt. And here the interesting thing is that uh, there's a significant amount of overlap with the business management literature on this as well. Uh, specifically theories coming out of Toyota and the experience of uh, Japanese firms. And then the fourth is that you scale learning through diffusion. You don't take exactly the same thing and reproduce it everywhere. You take the thing and diffuse it, meaning it's probably still going to look different. Even when you're scaling it, you're looking for something that works better. Uh, and there are implications there for leadership, meaning you're not going to use heroes, you're going to be using groups. And I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail today, but I am going to speak about the problem uh, focus and also about um, the idea of iterating. Now, the problem focus for a number of reasons. The first thing is that problems get changed onto the reform agenda. And, you know, in many, many organizations, we kind of say, well, we're problem driven. And I love the bank because the World Bank, uh, when I was there, they introduced something that required everybody in a project document to have the problem statement at the front of the problem document. So I'll get to Uganda again. My, my favorite example of this was uh, in, in, in a project on civil service reform. The problem statement was literally there isn't any capacity in Uganda's civil service. The reform was to introduce a human reform management information system. Uh, when five years later the system hadn't been implemented and wasn't working, um, the uh, post-mortem on, 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 on the project said, well, the project failed because they didn't have any capacity in the civil service system to implement the project. So you have to say to them, well, what is it that you thought about when you identified the problem? So one of the things that we speak about is you need to be purposeful about this which means processes of actually constructing a problem so you bring it onto the agenda so that you draw attention to it so people have to pay attention to it. That's why you're doing this. It isn't about just naming a problem. It's about getting data, getting stories and focal events that pull politicians and bureaucrats onto your side so that you can actually get them to address the problem. The second thing is that problems focus the search on relevant solutions. Meaning, we don't want people to be focusing on what other countries did that made them successful. We want them to be focusing on making themselves successful. And if you say to them, success is problem solved rather than solution introduced, it helps you to keep that focused. So, for example, you would say, well, what's your problem over here? And I'll come to an example of the Mozambican judicial sector in a, in a, in a minute. In, uh, in Mozambique, a project uh, sponsored by a variety of donors 
was introduced in the judicial sector to improve case management. And uh, the project expended between five and $15 million. I'm not sure because the records were so bad. And all it did was created an office that permanently hires six people. Uh, then we said, well, let's not focus on introducing a case management system. Let's ask them, uh, the authorities, what was the problem? And they said, well, the problem is that we just needed to be able to gather data so that we could make budgetary decisions. Because when we, when we ask in the Ministry of Finance to, for money for new judges, we need to be able to tell them where the judges are going to be and how many cases they're going to settle. And at the moment, we just don't have that data. Okay? So then you say to them, well, what would the problem look like solved? And they say, well, the problem would look like solved is if we had data that we could use to construct a better budget. They don't need a new system for that, right? They need an Excel spreadsheet with key data. Different thing. Completely different. So the problem solved is when do you have the data so that you can make the decisions? And that's what you focus on. Okay? The last thing is the problems draw agents together so you have enough support for change. And this gets to Niels's comments uh, early on that this is about building the political support for change. Uh, it's about getting the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus. And often the problems will help you make that uh, differentiation. Now, the second thing that we advocate is once you've identified the problems, you've constructed them, you've found out how you're going to tackle the problem, and there's some very uh, specific tools that we would suggest using in this, you want to crawl the design space in an iterative and, and, and learning way. Oh, a whole lot of jargon. So what I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to give you a, a, a diagram here. And I'm going to say to you that this is a, a, a chart of what I would call the design space for any problem that you face. On the left-hand side is what we teach our students are the solutions for the problem that have proved to be technically correct. We see these solutions in places and we know that they work. Okay? On the other side are the solutions that are proved to have worked in your context, meaning that you have some experience with actually doing them. You've worked out how to get them into the politics. You've worked out actually how to do the administration and the practical stuff. Okay? Now, the problem with this is, or, or let me get back... If you think about it, every little different square there shows some relationship between things that are not working, not technically correct, but we can do, or technically correct, but we haven't got any, any uh, experience with doing. I'd like you to think of every single block as a potential source of information to solve a problem. Now, what we do in development is that we locate ourselves in the top left-hand corner all the time, meaning we identify the thing which we've seen somewhere works to solve this problem, which is external best practice. The problem with that external best practice is that it hasn't been proven in this context. We don't know how to do it, right? They did it in Australia with a specific political regime, with a specific administrative capability. We may have that, but we don't know, right? The other thing that we know is in the bottom, existing practice, which we know is not technically correct because it's not solving the problem, but we know we can do. Now, oftentimes, those are the two pieces of information we have and we don't look anywhere else. And we say, well, we don't want to do that one over there, the existing practice, because that just can't be good. So we're going to try that one up in the top left-hand corner. What we say is, what about the other blocks? Is there anything what we would call positive deviance? <coughs> Meaning, are there any people in your context who actually are solving the problem, who are doing the thing better? And we could go and learn from them how they did it with the same resources, the same everything, meaning it's technically correct and it's in your context. So that seems like a really good thing to learn from. I very, very rarely see any governance or institutional reform projects in the design or the preparation phase that go and say, let's go and find and explore positive deviance. Okay? The second thing we could look at is we could look at what are the latent practices that are potentially there? Meaning we don't see them but if we put some pressure on the system and we actually tried to see what they could do in the short run if they used the capacities that maybe they had but didn't know about, maybe we'd find some things out. And here you have a bunch of rapid results work that could really help in the sense. So you could push into all of those blocks up the right-hand side, up in the top, top right-hand side. Now you want to crawl this design space. You don't want to just at the beginning commit to one best practice and then that's what your project is going to be. The result, if you call the design space, is you're probably going to end up with a hybrid. You're probably going to end up with something that's informed by best practice, something that's informed by positive deviance, something that's, that's informed by some of the, the latent uh, practices that you haven't tried yet. 
But if you, if you close off the blocks that you are looking for solutions from too early on in your project, you really, really hurt yourself. So PDIS says, let's crawl. Let's have a strategy for crawling. And in that strategy, what we want to do is we want to try multiple things at once because we don't really know what's going on in small iterations. Try things in three-month blocks. At the end of three, every three months, let's come back and let's say, what did we learn from trying that? Does it seem to work? Did we build any new capabilities? Is there anything else that we flushed out in the context that we found out could help us make a better decision? Tight feedback loops with lots of experiments lead to better solutions. Now, iteration matters because we don't know where we're going, and I'm going over time, so I'm going to just go quickly through this. I said we find form through function, and I'd like to suggest this chart over here, and I'll, I'll stop here uh, it, it, just, just uh, to uh, allow comments. But a lot of people say, well, how, why do you think you need to iterate? Now, we say that a lot of projects, essentially, if you think about it, this chart over here, we have legitimacy on the left-hand side, which is something organizations look for in change. We want to be serious. We want people to support us. We need to have author authority to do this, political authority, and we need to have money from donors. And then on the right-hand side, which you can't see, is essentially functionality, is it would be good if the reform also kind of helped us to do stuff. Now, the problem with a lot of reforms is that we want to go from A, where we don't have any legitimacy, and we don't have any functionality to be, where we have both of them. We want to be doing the thing right, and we want people to be patting us on the back and giving us money. Okay? We want both of those things at the same time. But we don't know how to do that. So the thing that we end up doing often is we end up just going up to the legitimacy thing, and then we never get any functionality. But what we are suggesting is you need to iterate to find your way up there, which means you push into the context and you say, well, if we know what functionality looks like as an end goal, but we don't know how to get there, why don't we try multiple things? But we can't try multiple things just endlessly because no one's going to give us the support to do that. So we want to do something for three months, and we want to try three or four things. And at the end of three or four things, uh, at the end of that period of time, we're going to go back to our political authorizers and to our donors, and this could be interesting for you guys, and we're going to say to them, this is what we learned and this is what we achieved. The work that I do with this is usually putting coaches into teams to make sure that they do this in that period of time. And then you come back and you say, we learned how to put a team together. We learned some new capabilities, and we learned that this thing looks like it might work, or this thing looks like it won't work. And then you kind of bring everyone together, and then you say, well, let's create a story that gives us some legitimacy so that we can give this reform some more life. And then you do the next iteration, and the next iteration, and the next iteration, and you find yourself ending up at B. Now, I told you it would be the last slide, but I also wanted to give you some sense of some of the work that we're doing, because I also told you that this is real. So the first work that we're doing to look at this stuff and to try and convince donors like you, you guys that this is doable is we've looked at uh, 30 cases of the innovations of successful societies from Princeton University. And they've identified uh, reforms that all involve donors in some, for some, some form or another, uh, where the reforms led to greater functionality. So an example is the Johannesburg City Council uh, restructuring so that it could deliver services and become um, uh, and, and balance its budget, okay, coming from a very bad place, supported by uh, GIZ, I think it was in that time. There's multiple others like that. And we asked ourselves, was this more the traditional, well, they developed a solution and introduced a big project and had someone telling everyone what to do, or did they iterate? Did they know what they were doing at the beginning, or did they try multiple things? Was it sparked by a problem? Here's the thing. In every single case, the problem was the thing that motivated it. The problem was the reason why they got politicians on board. The problem was the thing that drove their search for the solution. In every single case, they tried multiple things instead of one thing. In every single case, they routinely tried those multiple things in small bites, and once they did those small bites, they went back and they got support from the politicians. In a number of the cases, however, once they had a period of iteration and they had what I would call found and fitted solutions that worked for them, they then went into the big project because they needed big money so that they could scale the thing up. But in every single case, they needed a process of, of iterating around the problem to find the solution. And in every single case, they were supported by some donor or other. So that's one study. The second study is the one in Mozambique. We're in Mozambique. We've been for eight months now. 
And uh, in eight months, we've got in a $5 million or $5 to $15 million, I don't know how much it was, got in six years. So how we started there was essentially two uh, coaches putting a group together uh, with the government. No donors, no donor money, just two coaches sponsored by UNU WADA, sponsored by the, the recon work. And these guys embedded with the group essentially said to them, what's the problem with data in the sector? And the people said, well, the problem with data in the sector is that we, we don't really have data. So the first meeting I had was saying, well, what do we have at our own disposal so that in the next three weeks we as a group can, can try to do something new? So they said, well, we think that maybe we do have data, we just don't know where it is. So everyone was sent away to their own respective organizations and they had to come back and say, what data do they have? After three weeks, everyone came back and they all said, we all have data, but we're not allowed to share it. Now you're understanding the problem in a new way, right? In a new way that the previous project never ever got to because it made assumptions about about how the world worked and it didn't have any way of collecting information about how the world really worked. After the three weeks, we found out that the issue was authorizing and then capability and in two or three iterations beyond that, we now have an Excel spreadsheet where we have number of cases, number of judges, number of uh, prosecutors, number of buildings, number of vehicles, all in one place and next year they will use that data to construct a budget. In eight months with no money. Okay? And, 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 and not smoothly and not a nice process whatsoever, from my perspective. Lots of pushing, lots of shoving, lots of the stuff that is on there. But it can be done. It really, really can be done. The next step is going to be going and finding a donor who will support uh, something that looks a bit gnarly, a bit crazy, but that works. I call it a camel in Sahara instead of a hippo in Sahara. Smelly, it looks weird, but it works. And that's what we should be after. I've spoken for far too long, and I'm sorry about that, but I hope some of the ideas have been practical and interesting.